Welcome to Vario HQ in Helsinki, Finland. And today I'm really excited to be hosting to you the next inside session on bridging neuroscience and mixed reality to superpower the human existence and experience. With me, uh, uh, I have Connor and Eva. Maybe you can introduce yourselves. Thank you, Urho, for having me. My name is Eva. I work as an embedded software engineer at OpenBCI. I've been with the company for around three years, and my main responsibility is developing firmware and software for Galia, our latest product that we're going to talk about. But I also help a, a little bit on the business and marketing side of things. Yeah, Eva is selling herself short. She does a lot and wears many hats and was our first engineer in the company. So uh, she's, she's got a lot of experience working with the tech. I'm uh, Connor Rusimano. I'm the CEO and co-founder at OpenBCI. I've been building hardware and software for interfacing the human brain and body for almost a decade now. And very excited to be here today to talk about the partnership with Vario. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for having us. Oh, so glad you were able to make it. And I'm Urho Kontari, one of the co-founders and the CTO of Vario. And now, as we know that one thing which is for certain is that today's content is so exceptionally interesting, there will be plenty of questions and there will be questions that will not be answered unless you actually ask them. So please do use the Q&A tool during the session to feed in some super interesting questions and then we can make sure that we actually answer them. So if you feed those too late in the cycle, we might lose them. Uh, we have so big audience today, so there will be plenty of questions. Do shoot yourself uh, uh, first into the, into the queue. And, and you can do it throughout the session. Now, before we go into the neuroscience part, I'll just very quickly recap Barrio. Barrio is a startup from Helsinki, Finland, equally to you. Uh, we are now over 200 people. Uh, we have uh, thousands of uh, customer companies using our headsets. We focus on the enterprise-grade photorealistic virtual and mixed reality devices that offer human eye resolution, video see-through, pass-through, as well as uh, great uh, eye tracking capability on all products in the portfolio. We have offices in Finland, USA, UK, Norway, and we are selling in uh, over 40 markets today. Uh, but now what we have not been doing and don't do is brain computer interfaces. We just simulate, stimulate the brain. And this is of course where the cycle completes with the open BCI. Sure, yeah. So uh, some background on OpenBCI. We got started in 2013 with a Kickstarter campaign. And the original idea was to produce a brain-computer interface for makers. So at that time, you know, there, was, there was a void in the market where it wasn't easy uh, or cheap to get access to, to brain data. Uh, and so we kind of piggybacked off of the Arduino model and, and essentially built a, um, a, a Arduino for biosensing. So, uh, you know, that was kind of the original plan, and over the past tech, 10 years, I should say, or over the past decade, uh, those, those products have been adopted all over the world, and they've been used by other neurotechnology companies to get started. Uh, so, you know, the goal was really to build the kind of foundational building blocks for low-cost neuroscience research. Um, and now, you know, we've sold over 40,000 products for, for low-cost and open-source neuroscience research to over 100 countries around the world. So. You know, we're very proud of, of the impact we've made on the, the neuroscience community at large, and we're just getting started. Galia is a headset designed to make it as easy as possible to collect data from the brains, eyes, skin, muscles, and heart. The reason we combined Neurotech with VR was actually based on a long trend from our own users. VR is an excellent experiment platform where the data you collect from neurotechnology and biosensors can be used to do very interesting types of research inside of VR. The reason why we uh, chose the Vario Aero and the Vario headsets to work with for Galia, uh, it's actually, it was a, a couple different reasons. Really, we wanted a system that gave us access to high quality eye tracking and had very good visual fidelity for running experiments in it. And the Aero delivered on that front. We've seen over time, our neurotechnology audience using VR more and more because it really allows you to, uh, to bring your research a number of different directions in a much easier way. The faster they can collect data, the more subjects they can run inside of a given time frame, 
uh, it's huge cost savings, even beyond just what our system might cost versus other alternative uh, biosensor systems. People's reactions to Gallia are often, wow, this is the future of computers. You know, how long until this can read my brain and I can control things with my thoughts? And the truth is, we're not that far. What a great segue, and, and we really have come far. Um, and, and now, of course, a lot of you are wondering what is actually the state of the BCIs, the brain-computer interfaces, and what they're all about. So maybe you can talk us through some of the basics, Connor, first to get us started, and then we can actually dig a little bit deeper into the actual product and how that solves both on the, both on the hardware as well as on the software level. Sure. Yeah, so I think that this, this slide is actually really good because it says getting inside the mind. And I think that's an important thing to highlight here, which is that you know, a lot of times the mind and the brain are conflated. And we kind of see the brain as the same thing as the mind. But the truth is, is that the brain is an organ that is you know, kind of the nucleus of consciousness. But that information about the human mind, you know, what's going on inside of the head or, or what someone's thinking about, is actually represented all over the body. Um, and so now, you know, we, while we are a brain-computer interface company, we do focus on sensors for you know, measuring the mind, not just the brain. Um, when it comes to BCI, I think there's an important distinction that everyone should know about. Uh, there's invasive BCI. This is, you know, if you're familiar with Neuralink and, and the work that they've been doing recently, or other companies like BlackRock or, or Synchron, you know, they're working on invasive technology where sensors are actually going into the body or underneath the skull. Uh, in the case of OpenBCI, uh, you know, we are a non-invasive company. So our goal is to get as much data as possible without tampering with the body itself. So all of our sensors are non-invasive or external to, to the skin and body. Um, you know, there are trade-offs for both, but obviously um, you know, putting on an, a non-invasive BCI is a much simpler process um, and I think will be adopted uh, into, consu into the consumer landscape much sooner. Yeah, that um, makes sense. I would love to like, throw in so many questions, but one thing I will throw, is it dangerous as it's non-invasive? So no, it's, it's, it's not dangerous. You know, the, we're, we're not doing any uh, electrical stimulation. You know, the, we're only recording mm. from the brain and the body. Uh, and like I said, none of it is you know, uh, invasive, so you know, nothing is going under the skin. Everything is, is external. Um, you know, the uses, so you know, there, there's lots to consider when it comes to the ubiquitous adoption of BCI and what that could do to technology, te technology addiction, you know, social stratification, if tools like this become very, very valuable and they're actually mm -hmm. augmenting cognition so effectively that some people are getting smarter. You know, we have to, we have to think about how technologies like this get rolled out at scale, um, you know, because then the technology could be dangerous, right? And so, you know, the, I think it's important for us to make sure we always have, you know, what's best for humanity as a primary design yeah, constraint. When absolutely. We're, when we're working on these things. At the same time, it's super important that you can take absolutely anybody from the street, mm -hmm. use the technology, and it's safe. Yep. And you get the insight. But hey, um, before, uh, before we actually talk about the product, let's talk a little bit of the traditional BCI systems. And, and we wanted you to see this basically image of how traditionally in laboratories and research institutions, the cognition state has been researched. And to understand myself this domain a bit, I, I was reading uh, National Health Institute's report on the uh, history of the past 50 years in the BCIs, which of course started like a hundred years ago, like uh, 1924 we had the first measurements of the brain activity. But I, I, I want to read this quote really quickly to you to like, gauge why this is so important that we have a solid product. So this is from uh, 2021 January, just before COVID really hit us. Um, to sum it all up again, the BCIs took fiction known from the sci-fiction literature into reality by providing some ways to use thoughts for the control purposes. However, although the systems are becoming more and more achievable, there is still a problem which makes it difficult to bring them out of the laboratories into the daily life. And the problem is the convenience factor. Long calibration times, using abrasive paste or gel to improve 
improve conduction and time related to placing the headset on the scalp are on the verge of or, or slightly beyond the average user acceptance as, and when you look at this one you can totally see that happening like uh, putting all of these in calibrating then making sure that they are all functioning properly before you before you even run the study very tedious and this is of course what is changing with the Gallia so I think it's a marvelous step ahead on enabling any research company whether it is company like Vario or Bob or whatever to make use of the BCI. Mm -hmm. But maybe you would be able to give us a really brief intro on the two versions of the Gallia available today. Yeah, so, thank you for that, Orho. Yeah, I think the you know to kind of re reiterate what you said, you know, the past ten years we've been focusing on the reducing the setup time and increasing the convenience of using BCI systems. So. You know, not only is it non-invasive, you know, we don't have to cut the skin open or get under the skull, but also we, a lot of the traditional BCIs have used pastes or gels that you need to kind of create an electrical bridge between the electrode sensor and the scalp. You know, our systems are entirely dry, so there's no paste, there's no gel, and you know, ideally, you know, and, and this is the target, is to be able to put the system on and get it running in under a minute. So, you know, the, the, the target setup time is 60 seconds to get, you know, from zero to 60 with Super. You know, the VR headset plus the, the Gallia sensing system. So, you know, here we see um, uh, the Gallia uh, headset uh, with the Vario Aero uh, display attached. And so this was, you know, the first product that we announced. It was the VR integration. Mm -hmm. um, this month in January at CES, we, you know, we're really happy about this. You know, based on feedback from potential customers, there were a lot of people who were interested in applying you know, Galia's capabilities to the XR industry, so mixed reality. And so you know, very, very pumped to be able to include the, the XR3 as a, you know, a product offering with, with Galia. So I don't know if you want to talk more on the, yeah. the XR3. So. Yeah, so, so very quickly, in addition to typical VR experiences, the XR3, which is our flagship product today, we're extremely proud about that one. It has the like, absolute lowest lev um, latency video see through pipeline in the highest possible quality, which enables you to basically merge the analog reality around you with the digital reality of the virtual and have these perfectly mixing with the LiDAR, improving you to have the perfect composition of these two signals together. And I do believe that also elevates a lot of new use cases on top of what you can achieve with the just VR-based uh, uh, Galea. So I, I, I think it's a fantastic uh, solution. Yeah, a couple things to say on that. The, you know, the, I've worked in the mixed reality and augmented reality space for a long time, and I've tried to pretty much all the headsets, and the, the XR3 is the best pass-through AR that I've ever tried, and I'm not just saying that, they didn't pay me to say that, so, um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, we're, we're really, really pumped to, to be partnered with Vario, and, you know, I think what's really cool about this, you know, as opposed to just the Aero integration, is that this is really a stepping stone for technology like this to enter the real world. You know, virtual reality is an immersive experience, you know, you're doing it in, in a controlled environment, but, you know, when we think about biosensing and understanding human cognition with mixed reality, you know, that, you know, this is the stepping stone for, you know, the headsets that we're going to be walking around with in 10 years, you know, on the streets, you know, in working environments. And I think that this is really like, you know, this is the only thing I'd, that I want to be working on at the moment. So, oh. yeah. I, I fully buy that vision. Yeah. But <clears throat> now let's get a little bit deeper into the tech. So what makes it possible to actually read people's minds and, and maybe to a degree control it as well? And, and who better to talk about that one than Eve? Eva? So I think... Yeah. Yeah, here I'll hold the headset. Yeah. So. Okay. Cool. So yeah, let me walk you through the sensors that uh, Galia has. This is the XR3 beta prototype of Galia. And as you can see on the back of the head and the midline, we have eight active EEG channels. EEG stands for electroencephalography. So it measures the electrical activity coming from your brain, which is generated from the neurons firing together and creating these waves. Um, and we also have two EEG sensors on the forehead. On the face pad, maybe you can show yeah. that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So on the face pad, we have four EMG channels, which are located above and below the eyes. EMG stands for electromyography. 
Yeah, that's great. That's the electrical activity generated from the muscles of your face. So for example, if you're frowning or smiling, we'll be able to detect that using the EMG channels. Um, on the forehead as well, we have a PPG sensor that'll measure things like heart rate, blood oxygenation, heart rate variability, etc. And also an EDA sensor. EDA stands for electrodermal activity. It measures the conductance of your skin, which will change based on the moisture. So if you get a little bit nervous or stressed, the EDA will spike up. And then uh, in terms of the eyes, we have EOG, electroculogram. Um, we have a horizontal and a vertical channel for that. It measures the potential generated from your eyes when you move them. So we'll be able to see if your gaze is changing a lot and some of the movements you're making. And we complement that with the image-based eye tracking coming from the Vario headset. Uh, the eye tracking gives you even more in-depth metrics, like for example, pu pupillometry, which uh, also gives you indic indications into different uh, internal states of mind. And so um, that's a compilation of sensors and like Connor was talking about earlier, we not only combine uh, BCI with um, XR, but we also add on biosensors for the heart and the skin that allow us to uh, calculate way more complex metrics, like for example, the attention level of someone, uh, the emotions that they're having, uh, if they're concentrating or not, etc. And we time lock all of that and make it easy to collect. It's a, uh, you put it on and it, start, it starts working right away. So I don't know if you want me to go a little bit more in depth in the software. Yeah, um, let's, let's do that one, so. Yeah, so that's uh, a summary of the hardware. Now in terms of the software, uh, the Gallia package includes different applications. The first thing that we provide is a Gallia GUI. It's gonna show on the screen in a minute. This is a, it's an application where you're going to be able to see the data coming in from the device in real time. So we allow you to check out the different channels and see if they're making contact on your skin correctly or not, if you need to adjust it a little bit. On the screen, you can see me using Galia right now, and that's the OpenBCI GUI. So you see on the bottom, it's the heart and the skin data, and then on the left, muscles, eyes, and brain. The GUI also gives you a few metrics uh, like, for example, normalizing EMG data or filtering some of the EEG data, denoising it and calculating things like the frequency spectrum for the band powers. Those are what we call first derivative metrics. And then we have one more level, which is a SDK that is plug and play. You can use this with Unity and also with Unreal. This SDK not only has the raw data that we're showing you in the GUI, but it also has the first derivative metrics and also a set of machine learning models that we've trained to recognize some of the internal state of minds that I was talking about earlier, like the cognitive load or the attention. Uh, so in this way, if you're a researcher, for example, you have access to the raw data and you can calculate your own metrics from that. But if you're not super familiar with the neuroscience, you have a set of metrics that you can plug into your application directly. And also, these are models that you can add your data onto to personalize them a little bit more to the user. And another thing I want to mention, uh, Galia also includes an API. It's called BrainFlow, and it gives you support for the most common programming languages, so Python, C++, C Sharp, Java, MATLAB, and a few more that I can't remember off the top of my head. But with, with BrainFlow, you can integrate into applications. Say, for example, you're running experiments in MATLAB, or some other software. You can use BrainFlow to integrate with that. And also we support um, protocols like LSL and UDP and OSC, which are the main ones used for researchers working in neuroscience. So we, you can export the data out of our software using those protocols. I think this is super exciting and it's so important that you don't need to be a neuroscientist to actually make use of that one. So you can uh, deploy it throughout the organization and get uh, everybody integrating it into their existing software suits without having to have neuroscientists overseeing that activity. So yep. super yeah. clever, high-end APIs, love it. Um, with that, um, I, I think it's 
about time to show how this works in practice. Like uh, these graphs don't mean anything to almost anybody, but let's, let's, if you can walk us through one of the experiences and how to actually monitor the mental state of the people. So let's take a look at this. Yeah. So I think this is a great example um, of an experience that you could run and collect data with Galia. I, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but this is Richie's Plank. It's a VR experience where you go into an elevator that takes you to the top floor of a skyscraper, and then you have to walk on a plank and jump off. So what we did is we put Galia on someone that was going through this experience, and we started measuring things like their stress level, um, their heart rate, some of the metrics that we knew would be altered by an experience like this. And so right now they're in the elevator, and you can see their stress is pretty low. Heart rate is average what you would expect for someone standing up. And as soon as they start going on the plank, the stress level quickly starts rising and their heart rate as well. On the bottom of the screen, you can see the different metrics like the PPG, the EDA, the band power, EEG data coming in in real time. And you'll be able to see different markers that we are inserting. Those markers indicate um, the points at which we saw a sharp increase in some of the metrics that we're looking at, which is correlated to, for example, an increase in like, the stress or the gaze of the person moving really fast, which is usually associated with when you're nervous and you're trying to scan everything around you. And so these markers allow you to go back to the data and check out what are the key points that you would want to dive in further and analyze a little bit more. Yeah, uh, I, I think when we were watching this before, we were like, okay, when you end up in this white state, you're still stressed, but you can actually see that the pupillometry is dropping really fast. So you actually become relaxed, even though the heart isn't quite as quickly adapting to the more relaxed state. So it's yeah. so cool things and, and so fastly adapting. Also, one thing uh, worth pointing out here is that for example, in this experience, some people tend to like close their eyes when they're approaching the floor mm. because they get scared. So one of the use cases that we found for EOG is complementing that eye tracking from the barrio. When the person is closing their eyes, we still have a way to track the movements that they're making. So cool. Okay, so um, then let's go to the next level. So as as this has been reserved for like uh, academic research for like uh, really neuroscience related domains in, in maybe research institutions as well. And this is the work that you have been doing on bringing that from the lab to the real world, which is super exciting. So how do you see those like use cases now developing? Because let's face it, there has been nothing ever like this on the market. So you don't have that kind of like, uh, yes, these are the top 10 use cases for BCI in the world right now that actually make sense because those would mm -hmm. be like only like listing very academic use cases totally separated from the real world. So uh, can you talk us through that one a little bit because yeah. you do have experience on, on discussing with multiple companies, Connor. Yeah, so you know, you hit the nail on the head. Our, our kind of bread and butter industry, the, the what's you know kind of got OpenBCI going was research and development. So, hmm. you know, back in 2013, we set out to build a, a BCI for non-traditional users. So, taking EEG equipment out of the lab and putting it into the real world. Hmm. Um, over time, those devices got tested and validated by scientists. Um, you know, and and we found out that we had built uh, an EEG system that was as good as research grade equipment or medical grade equipment, but for one tenth the price. So when that happened and, and it actually got validated by, by scientists around the world, then we started to see uh, more, more cons uh, sorry, enterprise adoption. So companies buying OpenBCI equipment for R&D labs and looking at how do we integrate biosensing into our industry? How do we deploy this or, or think about integrating this onto a product timeline in the coming five to 10 years? And so now I think we're, we're actually seeing big companies investing lots of resources in this space. Great example, you know, Control Labs being acquired by Facebook or, or Meta for close to a billion dollars. And then there's a number of other neurotechnology companies that have been you know, either acquired or partnered with larger companies in the last couple of years. Um, you know, getting back to use cases, I think um, you know, one of the big ones outside of R&D uh, that came across you know, our uh, door was you know, working with Valve. So we had the opportunity to to you know, partner with Valve for a couple of years, and, and they had already been, you know, as kind of what I was saying before, they had already been buying our equipment and working with OpenBCI's core equipment inside of their research labs. 
Um, you know, and then they reached out to us when they heard about the, the Galio project. Um, you know, and I think for gaming, you know, a device like Galia has a, a lot of opportunity or potential to change things like playtesting. So mm. before a game gets rolled out, you know, putting players into the game and you know, looking at shifts in their physiology, shifts in their internal state of mind, you know, is this game bringing someone into a state of flow? Right? Most games are, are designed that way, way where you're trying to get the player to a state of flow where they're completely unaware of the outside world and they're totally engrossed in the game. Right? So if you can detect certain scenes or certain parts of the game that are boring, cut those parts of the game out. You know, and so for playtesting, it's really, really interesting. But you know, if you start to think about um, you know, the inclusion of machine learning and AI as you know, part of the gaming experience, you know, I, I think that in the future, we're going to have games that essentially design themselves. So you know, you've got all of this data being tracked about how the user is playing the game. There's no reason we couldn't have a game that learns you know, in the very first level, what is you know, capturing the attention or the interest of the user? Which characters does the user or the player like interacting with? Um, you know, and then using that information to actually build or generate the rest of the game algorithmically, right? So we actually have this kind of like closed loop system between the player and the game. Um, you know, I'm sure that you know, many people watching right now are also thinking about some of these same frameworks being applied to medicine or healthcare. Right, so a great example, um, you know, where a technology like this could already be applied, is uh, PTSD, right? And so, you know, one of the common techniques for addressing or treating uh, PTSD or any type of traumatic experience, you know, or a reaction to that is immersion therapy. So, how do we gradually bring somebody who is triggered by an experience back into that experience and kind of th through immersion, uh, gradually make them more comfortable with that experience again? You know, a an example of this would be. You know, somebody who has a fear of flying, you know, or, or an anxiety around flying, can we, you know, before taking them on a real plane, can we put them in a virtual flying experience, right? And, and then also track their stress and track their anxiety so that if it gets too intense, we have, we have a kill switch. We can just turn the game off or you can just take the headset off, right? That's a very difficult thing to do in the real world because, you know, you can't just abruptly land a plane, mm. right? You have to find another landing strip and bring the plane down. So if somebody is starting to have a panic attack, you know, in that experience, you just got to play it out. But in VR, we can, for one, we can actually toggle, you know, algorithmically, we can toggle the intensity of experience, mm. right? It, it can actually be a, a variable experience based on how well somebody is doing. But also there's a kill switch. You can just take the headset off, right? So I, th I think, you know, that's a, that's a great example. But, you know, there's, you know, for things like attention disorders, you know, there's many games now that are being used to treat attention disorders as opposed to pharmaceuticals, as opposed to medication. Mm. So I think you know, a device like this could be used for many, uh, for many things within healthcare to try and look for alternatives to medication, um, mm. or even as a complementary technology or solution to medication that, to verify that a, that a drug is working as intended. Mm. Um, you know, beyond that, you know, I think there was a ton of interest. We were at the ITSEC uh, conference, and there was a ton of interest in flight simulation and training, you know, automotive experiences, and looking at you know, a, a driver engagement, drowsiness, and these mm. kind of like very relevant uh, internal states of mind to, to the driving experience. Uh, so, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, like everything we've ever built, we've, we try to build Galia as a foundational tool, as a technology, really like a stepping stone mm. for our customers to figure out how to deploy, you know, a derivative of this device or technology into their own industry. Yeah. And I think we're gonna continue to do that and, and kind of like, you know, you can kind of think of our customers as the brains behind the brains. Mm. We want to be the brains behind the brains behind the brains. <laughs> so, very abstract. I do love that uh, this enables in any kind of like um, the PTSD, the PTSD um, uh, evaluations and such to not to just rely on the feedback and comments by the patient because they. Uh, they might not be able to really consciously understand what's going on in their heads, whereas this is very objective instrument to answer, understand that one. And as you said, like a dial down the experience is needed far ahead of it actually like escalating to anything, mm -hmm. right. as well as in like uh, training and simulations. And this is uh, the area where I have had a little bit of touch into this domain is, is when you need to be learning uh, stressful experiences and mm -hmm. you can then monitor the progression that 
gradually by the 20th time the, the uh, pupil is not anymore that stressed. You can see that they have actually been learning and now they would be comfortable doing that same thing in the real world as well. Right. Whether it is like a, flying a very um, uh, tight uh, uh, stressful mission in a, in a plane or something like this, you can actually toggle that down far ahead of time and see the progression all the, all the time. So. Right. I think there's, there's this theme, actually, uh, sorry. I, didn't no, I was just going to say, another uh, application side that we haven't touched on that much is using Gallia for control. Mm. So we do track a lot of metrics with it, but you can also use the EMG especially to control um, the scene and not use your controllers or, for example, if your hands are busy, during a training experience where you're learning something to do with mechanics, for example, mm. you can use your face to have additional channel inputs. Or people who have mobility issues mm. will be able to do uh, more things with Gallia because they, they can use their face and the muscles that they have available. Yeah. So that's another. I mean, this is God given for paralyzed people. So yeah. yep. really, really interesting. Okay, so uh, you you guys brought a couple of like uh, example uh, experiences as well. So let's take a look at those, and, and maybe you can talk over those uh, sure. while we're watching them. Yeah. So this actually to the, to what Ava was just talking yeah, that's about. That's a good example. Uh, yeah, we call this the third arm demo, and the idea here is that we we create this kind of virtual appendage that you learn how to control, and that that appendage can be mapped to anything in the virtual or physical space. Um, so here in this demo, your hands are occupied, and you actually you have to use your hands to kind of slow down and control these, these conveyor belts. But then you actually use this kind of mini keyboard on your face. So there's like four buttons that we've mapped to the left cheek, the right cheek, the left eyebrow, and the right eyebrow. And then we, we, we train uh, the user how to push those like buttons, essentially, almost like a, like a controller, a game controller. So you have uh, four additional uh, uh, binary inputs that you can use from your face to control a drone that flies around the space and helps you. So this is an example of kind of human-machine symbiosis. How do we you know, leverage additional buttons and things from around the body that essentially have no purpose for us anymore, or mm. at least not while we're using the computer? How do we give those muscles purpose again and remap them kind of, you know, it's not too dissimilar from the first time we learned how to use a keyboard, mm. right? Like the first time we use a keyboard, we're thinking about every single button that we're pushing, like there's the T button, there's the A button, but over time your brain abstracts that, right? To the point where you can actually think in sentences and you're, and you're never thinking about your fingers, right? Mm. It's just, you're just firing little messages out. The brain is very, very like elastic. It's very, it's very good at adapting itself and cutting out the middleman of conscious, like cutting out the in-between steps to where like, you know, from point A to, to point Z, you don't think about everything, all the letters in between, right? And I think like right now we're essentially building, you know, novel keyboards that you're, they're just mapped to your face as opposed mm. to your fingers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one example, you know, I think that there's, you know, with an example like this, you know, there's a lot of companies that are trying to use EEG or the actual brain computer interface mm -hmm. for interaction, yeah. real time control. But I think that the, you know, real time control should be, we should use the path of least resistance to solve problems. And in almost all examples, you know, even locked in patients, people who have very, very close to almost no residual motor function, in most cases, there, is, there still is some residual motor function. And we can latch onto those muscles and reprogram them much more easily than tapping directly into the brain. Um, so anyway, this example here is really just showing how quickly you can learn how to use muscles on your face for real-time control. Yeah, and um, this is available as a, like a dev kit example as well, right? Yeah, this yes. is one of the one of flagship demos in our, in our kind of I, Gallia software I, suite. It feels like a superpower. It must feel bad when you walk in the real world and you cannot do it anymore. Yeah, it's, yeah. Wow. you get yeah. used to it. Incredible. Sorry. So let's let, take a look at the second one. Yeah, I think, uh, so this one is called synesthesia. And so remember earlier when we were talking about the traditional EEG system, so traditionally we've been able to monitor uh, the brain status, but with the addition of XR technology, now we have a way to actually influence it. And so we can give the user feedback um, on what's going on in their brain and change the scene according to it. And this is an example of how we do that. So synesthesia room uh, is this environment which has colors that are mapped 
to the different frequencies that your brain is producing. So usually we split these frequencies into band powers and each band power is associated with a different state. Like for example, the alpha, mm -hmm. which is uh, eight to 13 Hertz is associated with relaxation. And we map that one to the color green. Uh, also it has sound, so each, each band power is mapped to a different instrument. So for example, when you're relaxing and producing alpha, the whole scene will go green and you'll hear a specific instrument. Mm. So even if your eyes are closed, you, you still get some feedback. So using the visual and the auditory um, feedback that the headset gives you, you can find out, okay, what things can I do to make myself relaxed and actually get confirmation that you are indeed relaxing and start training your brain um, to get to the states that you want. You can use it for concentration as well. So we provided this as an example of a basic neurofeedback application that you can get started with. Wow. To, to add to that, I just want to say that there, there is this common theme of like closing the loop between the man or the, you know, the human and the computer, the, the, whether it be AI or whatever that's inside of that computer, right? There's this, there's this relationship that's developing, which is like, you know, we're able to, the, the computer is able to listen to us and start to understand what our mind looks like in the context of a game or some digital experience or even the real world, right? Like when we, when we have headsets like the XR3, we have a, lots of information about the external environment. When you include Galia, we now have information about the internal environment, right? And, and when we have all of that information that, you know, you know, we have all that sensor technology and we have a computer, right, that is monitoring the external world, the internal world, but also the, the, the loop between what you're seeing and the way that your brain is reacting. We now have this really, really interesting relationship where we can build interference patterns. Like, almost like in physics, if you have a wave, right, and you take the exact same wave and you put it one out of, out of phase by, you know, by half a phase, those two waves will cancel each other out and make a flat line, right? And so you, you, you know, but if you play them in phase, they'll, they'll amplify each other, mm. right? And so, you know, with technology like this, what we can actually, like what we're effectively building is complex feedback loops where we can alter, if we understand the human mind and, and what it looks like during a certain feeling or internal state, then we should be able to amplify that. Or, do the opposite. You know, if, if you're trying to avoid being stressed or avoid being anxious, if we know what those signals and those waves look like, can't we just flip them upside down and put them back into the brain, mm. right? And so that's kind of, you know, obviously that's, that's an oversimplified version of what we're doing, but that, that idea, that theme of like closing the loop between the human and the machine is definitely this kind of re recurring pattern in what we're talking about. I, I think it's also one of the great testimonies that the great technology can be used for the good and the bad. And this is for certainly one of those cases. And obviously uh, the good is all that we aspire for. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, do, you, do you have like, um, just before we go to, to the Q&A where we have tens of questions, do you have like a, an insight into like what's going to be like a next, what's going to be the next exciting thing in the domain? You want to take yeah, this? Yeah, Talk about it first. I, I mean, I was actually just, uh, you know, kind of, I was just talking about it, right? But I think the, you know, the exciting thing about, you know, this kind of, this idea of closing the loop, right, is, you know, if we, as the user of that computer, stay in control of that feedback mm. loop, right? Like, if, if the system is designed where, you know, there's a high-level function, right, where you've got parameters or inputs to this function, but you as the user are determining what's going into those functions, right? As opposed to, you know, technology company, ABC, whatever, you know, mm. that's rolling out an application, you know, like really we should be thinking about the AI that exists inside of the future computer as our little Jiminy Cricket. I don't mm. know if you know the analogy, but Pinocchio has in, in the Disney movie has like a little, you know, you know uh, secret friend that only he can talk to Right, but little Jiminy Cricket is his conscience and it's always trying to guide him in the right direction and mm. to make healthy decisions and healthy choices and things like that. You know, I think in an ideal world, that's what artificial intelligence becomes, right? Where it's, it's a very personalized um, AI that is prioritizing your mental health, your well-being, you know, making sure you're getting enough sleep and it's able to track how you're using the rest of technology at large and make sure you're using it in a healthy way, right? So obviously that's a, that's a very difficult challenge, especially mm. with the pressures of 
you know, capitalism and yada yada and companies that are rolling out applications for other purposes than mental health. Right? Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think about this in this kind of closed loop, and I see technology like this as really, you know, being the core of us both understanding the human mind, but also expanding it. And and like, what can we do? How can we adapt our consciousness? Um, so, yeah. Yeah. For me, I often look at it as like the next step of things like, for example, the watches that we wear nowadays, which are already tracking our data, like my, uh, my Garmin tracks my sleep, how much energy I'm going to have for this day, my stress level, mm. and things like that. And I think with the addition of uh, the brain data and some of the other data types is in Gallia, we will be able to measure more complex um, internal states and have this guide that Connor is talk about, as, uh, talking about as long as we make sure that the, you know, we're developing the ethics of the field correctly as well. Mm, yeah, it's, and a, so, it's super interesting topic as well and, and would be great to be sometimes proactive and not retroactive on, on, on regulations and these kind of things. And I think, I think also yeah. people uh, sometimes look at as like a whole different world but if you think about it, we already have so many devices on us that track mm. our things and we use our fingerprint to unlock our phone. So we already have biometrics integrated into our daily life. And I don't think, it, you know, it's crazy to think that in a few years, the, those will include um, all the metrics that we're talking about today. Yeah. So. Exciting. Hey, uh, so uh, we still have time to uh, include a couple of more questions. So if you do have pressing things to shoot those into the session, so happy to go through those. And uh, I'll start shooting now uh, the questions so you can keep the answers short um, or, or, uh, or branch out if you, you feel like it. But we have plenty. So first of all, uh, thanks for the super interesting session. Are we going to see brain implant BCIs in the next few years? I, I take it not just from you, but from the like, industry in general. So how do you see that? Yes. In fact, we, there already are plenty of brain implants that are, that are being deployed into humans. So the, you know, a lot of people like to talk about Neuralink. There are a number of other companies that have mm. been doing it for decades yeah. and actually have dozens of human trials. Um, you know, a company that we you know, work closely with, BlackRock Neurotech, um, they've been building, you know, invasive BCIs for over a decade, and mm. they've got, I think it's 40 um, people now with, with implants that are controlling, you know, uh, robotic arms and virtual interfaces with actual invasive BCIs. Um, you know, there are a lot of challenges that come along with it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like the, a lot of times those, those sensors can't stay in for more than a couple of years. I think the longest that some of those sensors have been in is close to a decade, right? But there are biocompatibility issues, um, you know, and so I think there's, you know, I don't think it's going to be one or the other when it comes to invasive versus non-invasive. There's going to be people who desperately need invasive sensors, you know, mm. uh, individuals with ALS or other forms of, of you know, motor disabilities where the utility of having that, that you know, that extra fidelity and the extra, mm. extra efficacy in the data is worth going through, uh, you know, a rather invasive surgery to get an implant. Obviously, like, it's gonna, we're going to get better at those implants and they're going to get smaller, they're going to get, you know, the biocompatibility will get better. But I think, um, you know, ubiquitous adoption of BCI is going to happen via non-invasive technologies like the ones that we're building. Yeah. Um, yeah. Truly makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, lighter weight question: Are there any games out there that already utilize Galea? So, actually, we've been working with a few partners, mm -hmm. um, alpha partners that already are using Galea for their research, and they're developing applications. For example, for training uh, drivers, like Connor was talking about mm. earlier, detect drowsiness and things like that, and also. Um, the, one of the main reasons we actually built Galia is because a lot of researchers were trying to combine EEG and EMG and VR by themselves and integrating it. Mm. And it was time consuming and costly for them to sync all the data. And so even though those people don't have a Galia yet because we're, um, we're working on the beta at the moment, they have built applications that use these different modalities for things like uh, stroke recovery um, and rehabilitation and things like that. Yeah. So they have proven the concept. Yeah, super. So uh, 
is it available or can you go and buy a Galea? Great yes. question. You can pre-order a Galea right now. So we, the, the Galea beta program is open right now. Uh, we've got a number of, of beta customers and partners already. This is a really awesome opportunity to be one of the first people to ever get to work with Galia. Um, you know, I think that this is a, you know, we're, we're gonna prioritize our beta customers and, and make sure that the devices that they get are, you know, maintain, func you know, maintain function. If anything breaks, we're gonna be the, like immediately replace it. You know, I, I think that this is, that, you know, they're gonna be the ones to prove the value of this technology. Mm. Like I said, we're the brains behind the brains behind the brains. You know, we are trying to supply you know, the, the next generation of the companies that are actually going to deploy derivatives of Galia into their industries, right? I think that there's, there's so, there are so many applications mm. of a system like Galia that we can't pick right now. Yeah. Like, and we don't want to pick. We want, we want to enable technologies like this to become ubiquitous through different types of applications, right? And so getting back to your question, yes, you can pre-order now and yes. please do. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. So then I have no idea what this means, but I will shoot it. Do you have full OSC support? Yes, we have support for OSC. You can get the stream exported from the OpenBCI GUI in real time. Excellent. So O something stream. <laughs> Excellent. So um, is there a path for companies that already have XR3s to leverage this and use Galea and beta program without purchasing another? No. No. <laughs> we Very are, clear. We are yeah. doing the full system integration. So we, we want to make sure that the device that arrives to our customers is functional out of the box and mm. that there's no tampering with you know, either the XR3, the Arrow, or the Galia system. Uh, so, you know, it's, we're prioritizing making sure that every system works and that we do the integration ourselves. Yeah, that makes sense. And while it looks very similar, there is like a significant mechanical level um, uh, changes in the device itself. It's not an add-on, it's a whole new device. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, how big and what is the role for data scientist slash machine learning engineer in BCI technologies? Very big. Huge. Yeah. I, yeah, do you want to elaborate? Yeah, I was just going to say, so one of the main fields of development right now is being able to classify emotions accurately. So there's a lot of research groups all over the world and including us who are working on cracking this problem. So I think um, there's a huge potential and I think it's going to keep increasing over the next few years because having those metrics is essentially one of the most valuable things, if not the most valuable thing about mm. products like Galia. So if you're in that field, yep. I think you're in the right place. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot and maybe answer myself. What dangers exist for the individual confusing reality with virtual reality, etc.? And I, I, I think it's, it's one of those things that when you use really like a deep VR experiences, you do lose yourself into that. Like a, I had, for example, a, a, a very visceral feeling when I played the Half-Life Alex for the first time for That's hours awesome. <laughs> and then I walked to our living room and felt two things were not possible. I wasn't able to reach out to a cup and have it appear in my hand and I felt at loss from that one. I felt that my new self was assuming that's possible. Yeah. And it felt, I, I felt so crippled yeah. by not being able to do it. And then turning by actually turning felt very laborsome because I had gotten <laughs> accustomed to just like a finger is enough to do it. So I, uh, it's possible to confuse to a degree these realities, but really like uh, you don't fully like as a normal cognitively like a safe person, you don't mix these too much. Mm -hmm. yep. Just like your dreams. Um, uh, does the Vario BMI have the ability to have used within Unreal through plugins, or would that have to be coded by scratch? But this is obviously means actually you, not the Vario BMI, but, mm -hmm. uh, but the OpenBCI. So the, uh, the intent is that can you actually okay. use plugins instead of actually coding from C, C++? You can use plugins. So we provide a plugin that is essentially plug and play. Like you import it 
into Unity or Unreal, and you can start visualizing the data straight away or mapping it to objects in the scene. You mm. also have the option to code it for people who want more flexibility. Mm. So we, we try to offer this modular approach that gives you access to everything so you can choose depending on the industry that you're at and if you're a developer or not. Yeah. yeah. To kind of add to that, there's, you know, there's the three, we see that all of the data or all of the ways to use Galia separated into these three, data, three tiers of data. There's raw data, which if you're a neuroscientist and, and you want access to the raw data uh, because you don't trust our classifiers, or you don't trust the neuroscience that we've done internally, we always share the raw data. You know, that's what makes it a, a research tool. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a derivative layer, which is you know, first order derivative metrics like heart rate, heart rate variability, all of the brain waves and you know, some basic signal processing applied to these signals to make them more visible or viewable on a standard graph. Mm. So that's kind of like tier two, I guess you could say. And then where we're putting a lot of our work right now, and this is you know, to all the machine learning experts out there, is how do we now take, make kind of second order derivative uh, data sets such as stress, cognitive workload, you know, arousal, attention, shifts in attention, you know, drowsiness, so you know, this is where you know, we're, we're putting a lot of work in to train data sets and to kind of learn what does the average brain look like or what does the average mind look like during these different cognitive states. And mm -hmm. then one step further is actually rolling out uh, calibration mechanisms where you as an individual right, can try the generic model and if it doesn't work that well for you out of the box, you can mm -hmm. actually adapt that model by calibrating it to your own physiology. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I think that's where most computers are headed, which is this kind of this idea of empathetic or personalized computing where the computer is over time adapt, adapting its operating system to the user. Excellent. 5 minutes remaining. So we're able to do a few questions still. Can Galea interpret our emotions better than what we humans do? I think two sides personally and then uh, gauging some other person's emotional state. That's an interesting question. That is an interesting one. I would. I would say, I would say it, it can, depends. Yeah, <laughs> it can like quantify it. Yeah. So what we're looking for here is trying to quantify objectively some mm. of these things that we know how to understand intuitively, mm. but not so much how to like quantify and then use this for whatever purpose we want. So. I don't know if it's better or worse. We're just looking for a more like, scientific way of decoding some of this information that the human mind can decode and we're not sure how, yeah. how we do it. And then you can actually compare between individuals as well as time periods, which you cannot do with intuition, even yourself. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Try to recall what was your emotional state a couple of months back, like, phew, not happening. And also you're able to access um, changes that you wouldn't notice normally. So the EDA, for example, sensor will spike up as soon as you get a little bit nervous and you won't notice that you're sweating, but mm. you are. Yeah. It's, a tiny difference and so we can we can visualize things like that that you wouldn't be able to tell just normally there is a segue question on how do the skin sensors discern between someone getting physically hot and sweaty due to extortion versus the skin moisture becoming it for example due to stress so this is, this is a great question and it is one of the challenges yeah. so you know a lot of people just sweat inside of a VR headset regardless Right? Mm -hmm. And so there's things we can do to try and extract the signal from the noise. So using accelerometer data, if someone's moving a lot, mm. right, and, and we see a lot of motion, we can assume or make assumptions about their energy exertion. And so if we see big shifts in sweat activity and also a lot of movement, mm. then we can say, hey, that might be due to the movement. But yeah. if they're not moving at all, right, then we, can, then, then we have a stronger indication that it's related to stress and not physical exertion. Yeah. So that's an example of things that we can do, but you know, there's always going to be noise, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's a matter of extracting the signal from the noise. Mm. And, and it's also multi-sensorial, so not relying on that one, using the eye arcades, the other things, so like a higher level abstraction right. as yeah. well. Okay, uh, this headset would be excellent for neuro-rehabilitation medical studies. Mm -hmm. It might also be good for translation of alpha sick patients, so how do you reflect on that one? Uh, alpha, sorry, alpha sick alpha patients. I don't know, maybe 
Sorry, what's, I'm not what's, familiar, yeah, I'm not with, familiar with the autism. Okay, so, yeah. so maybe yeah. we take it as, as maybe. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, are you open to collaborating with any university to establish the lab for AR, VR and BCI? Uh, would you be able to know the procedure and like, uh, how would that actually happen? Uh, definitely. Uh, if, if you haven't reached out to us already, the best way to get in contact uh, regarding uh, Galia is galia at openbci.com. Yeah. Right? So galia at openbci.com. If you email galia at openbci.com with any question, we will answer it. Mm. Okay. Uh, who in the scientific community are you working with to interpret all the data uh, that you're collecting? Or is it up to your customers to interpret this complex data? So, so we're, we're doing a lot of that work internally. So, you know, Musa is our neural data scientist. He's, uh, you know, one of the more recent members of the team. But that, that, that division of the company is a primary focus, you know, over the coming, actually, for the, for indefinitely, is expanding the internal team that's working on, you know, training the classifiers for these different internal states and then verifying those, those classifiers by, getting, by collecting large data sets. Um, yeah, so I would say uh, yes. Excellent. <laughs> this looks fantastic. Where would we be able to test such a system? We'd be wanting a way to get to know the system before purchasing, like a probably typical, a quite typical question. So yeah, so I mean, this is tough because we've only got uh, you know a dozen alpha devices, mm -hmm. and we do have some of them loaned out to you know partners that we worked with for a long time who are helping us validate you know and, and you know confirm our assumptions about the the way that the device is working. Um, if you're hell-bent on trying it before buying it, you can schedule a time to come and visit us mm -hmm. in New York, oh. and, and you know, we can walk you through a, an in-person demo. Alternatively, we can do um, remote demonstrations where you know, we show you in real time over a video call, one of us connected to the headset and talk you through the different data sets. So we've done this on webinars, and you can actually you know, if you want to go and look at the data in one of our webinars, we have live data streaming. The first webinar that we did together, yeah. I think it was in July of last year. Yeah, in the summer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, last summer, and you know, reach, reach out with questions, we can share that with you. But yeah. unfortunately, we can't ship alpha devices around right now, mm -hmm. um, unless yeah. you're a paying customer, because we're, we're reserving it for... How about uh, any, any like, uh, avenues like AWE or any <laughs> other exhibitions? That is a great example. We're, we're the next uh, exhibition or, or conference that we're definitely going to be at is the BCI meeting in Belgium in June of this year. Um, so at that point, we will be doing live demos, but we just kind of finished our flurry of conferences. Yeah. If you do have, if you're interested in the software integration side of things, we also have packages that we can send that have examples of the data and emulating what it would look like so you can test it on your software. So that's also yep. an option. Okay, how about have you integrated a deep learning solution in your software to identifying emotions, happiness, sadness, fear from Galea's neuron signals? Um, this would be a question for Musa. Yeah, so Musa is the main person working on this. Um, he's training like different models. I'm not super familiar with yeah. like machine deep he's using, but uh, the emotions that they're mentioning in that question are the ones that he's working on. Yeah, absolutely. So super interesting. Then this might be a, a, a bit of pre, like a preempting. Are there any implementations for paraplegic lower body paralysis or quadriplegic uh, all four limbs paralyzed patients? So yeah, we're actually working right now uh, with an individual named Christian who's lived his whole life with pretty severe motor disabilities, and um, you know what we're doing is figuring out where there is residual motor function, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of times, you know, people with, uh, with motor disabilities still have muscles that work. They just don't work fully or as intended to actuate limbs and they, don't, may, they may not have the strength to lift an arm up, but there's still messages getting through. Mm. And so, you know, one thing that we've put in, been putting a lot of work into is how to kind of turn any residual motor function into a generic button. Wow. Right, where we can map it to uh, a little switch that can be on or off, or even have granularity, almost like a potentiometer, where you're, you have a dial of, of strength. Right? And so the shorter answer is we, we, we've already built these implementations. It's just that they, in a lot of cases, have to be rolled out 
in a very person by person or case by case way, mm. where, right? Where you have to diagnose where is the residual motor function? Is it on the face? Is it on the arms, et cetera? And so the beta version of Galia will have GPIO inputs where we'll have the ability to take additional inputs or, or mm. sensors that we can drop down to other parts of the body nice. to plug into the headset. And so, and that way you can kind of aug augment your data stream with, you know, any, you know, any additional inputs that you want. Yeah. Um, there's and eye tracking is, of course, like a fantastic tool yeah. that yeah. is super easy to take into use in any application environment as well. Yeah, yep. sorry. Go There's ahead. also a few studies that I've come across in the past couple of years where they've used OpenBCI equipment, which is not Galia, but our other headsets like the Ultra Cortex mm -hmm. um, or the Electrode Cap to help patients with ALS. So if you go to our community page in the OpenBCI website, there is actually a few posts of uh, scientist groups that have worked to help them to communicate and move. So you could check those up as examples because we are using the same, you know, similar technology. I think we are done on the time. I have two fast questions, so cool. fast answers. Um, so first of all, um, can you record and download raw signals with Galea? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Being a dry contact headset, is the signal strength even less or signal quality worse compared to applying fluid? I like the idea that it is quite fast to use as opposed to and then yeah. use. Uh, we put a lot of work into optimizing the dry system. You know, mm. We've been working with dry systems now for over five years and we're getting very, very good signal quality. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to say it better than that, but it's, you know. Yeah. We have validated it against the, elect the white electrode cap in experiments like SSVP or P300, mm -hmm. which are the standard scientific ones that you use, and it performs well. And then I'm overblowing schedule because I'm so curious on this one. How accurate is this under motion, like say in a moving vehicle? Yep. So this is a, a great question. I think in a moving vehicle, you know, there's... Uh, it's all about relative motion, right? If you're in motion and the vehicle's in motion, then you're gonna get pretty good quality. Um, this is kind of related to a previous, previous topic, but we, what we're doing now is using accelerometer information mm. to, um, when we see a lot of movement, uh, doing artifact extraction, you know, and at least knowing that if there's a signal, mm. a large jump in voltage, that it could be related to movement as opposed to something coming from the muscle of the brain. And so that's, that's the best way to do it, is to use accelerometers to kind of like detect when there's a lot of motion, but yeah. Excellent, so with that, I thank both of you as well thank as everybody on the us. line. And very importantly, you can contact us to learn more. So hello at varjo.com or contact at openbci.com and the websites are there as well, openbci.com and varjo.com. Thank you so much for everybody for joining in thank and for all the fantastic questions and it's it's been a delight so thank you all. Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.